Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining. So good to see you all. Um, my name's Faith and welcome everyone to this GFA Consumer Masterclass. We're gonna be talking about defining terms and understanding sustainable brand practices today. Um, but firstly, just to say, hi, my name's Faith. I'm head of content here at Global Fashion Agenda. We're in the office in Copenhagen. It's a really pretty day, although there's all sorts of crazy things happening around the world today. So thank you for being with us and I'm um, really looking forward to this, to this hour we're gonna to spend together. So um, Global Fashion Agenda is um, based here in Copenhagen and is a nonprofit forum um, on a mission to accelerate impact towards what we call a net positive future. Um, again, lots of different terminology in that, in that sentence alone, which proves um, what we're here to talk about today. But I'll get to the content in a second. Um, I wanted to say that this is a project from Global Fashion Agenda Academy, which is a team within GFA uh, that focuses on knowledge sharing, um, uh, informing and creating this platform to have conversations and extend the dialogue. So um, we've done a couple of different masterclasses this year, a five part series earlier this year, which some of you may have joined on our GFA monitor document. But today it's um, the first in a three part series that is all about connecting brands with consumers in different kinds of dialogues um, from a brand perspective and a fashion industry perspective. So today we're gonna have a presentation first, looking at an amazing case study and a really beautiful communications project. Then we're going to have a panel discussion and I'm really excited to introduce my panelists in a few minutes time. And after that, we'll address some questions that you might all have. So please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, really curious about what your questions might be and I'll try and get through as many of them as I can. Um, the, the session today is being recorded and that means that um, everyone who's signed up, a couple of hundred uh, people, a uh, couple of hundred people have signed up, yep. So it means that we'd be able to share this session afterwards. Um, and any of you guys can watch it back too on the globalfashionagenda.org website. So yeah, we're recording. Um, and I'm really, uh, really happy to be your host and moderator today. So I'll be connecting the dots between all the amazing experts that we've got joining us. So thanks everyone for being here and for our speakers too. So let's get back to the purpose of the session today. We are talking about defining terms and understanding sustainable brand practices. So what that means is kind of understanding how we can create these better dialogues, um, understanding what these words mean, how they're used and how they contribute to communications around responsible fashion that we can all get on board with and enjoy. So um, I, I would love to uh, introduce Lara. Lara's gonna be our first speaker presenting a couple of slides. Hey, Lara, it's good to see you. How are you doing? Hi, Faith, thank you. Um, Hi everyone, my name's Lara. I'm a senior series developer on um, on Fashion Redressed uh, with BBC Storyworks. Uh, yeah, just delighted to be able to contribute to the panel today. I'm really excited actually to hear more from, um, from the others on the call. Um, but just going to kick things off with um, a bit of a short presentation. Um, as I hope at least some of those on, on the call are aware, we uh, last month saw the release of the Fashion Redressed film series. This was a series that was, produced for, um, that was produced for the Global Fashion Agenda and it was by BBC Storyworks and really set out to ask, can the global fashion industry put more back into the planet and people than it takes out? Um, and profiling some of the innovators and, and organizations that were sort of racing to answer that question uh, in the affirmative. So we had each, each particular film that focused on a specific solution or character or story. Um, and within that really managed to, to cover a lot. I think we had silk spinning, spiders in Helsinki. We had color researchers in Cambridge. Uh, we looked at a, a pre-loved pioneer in Paris uh, and some of the importance of um, cultural- Sorry, just let me know when I should hit the slide forward. Of course, yeah. Uh, in Arizona. So we'll play a, a trailer shortly and, and share a link to the series. But if you just go to the next slide, Faith. Um, so I've led development of, of this series and my job is really working at, at that early pre-production stage to connect dots across a really in-depth industry uh, audience, creative insights to sort of draw up a bit of a uh, data-driven storytelling strategy where we can uncover and dig into the themes and narratives and tone that's kind of best engage and inform uh, global audiences when it comes to sustainable fashion. And so to kind of better 
understand all of those things, we commissioned uh, a BBC Global Minds survey. It's essentially a survey of, of 6,500 global bbc.com users. And I'd love to just talk through some of the, the really top line findings from that survey, which I hope can frame some of the discussion that our, our panelists will have today, but also I think reference some of the, the ways that those insights found their way ultimately into that into that series, into that final product. Um, if you just go to the go to the next slide, please, Faith. Thanks. Um, so I guess the, the first thing to note with, with um, the survey was that there is this significant and actually indeed increasing uh, consumer interest in sustainable fashion. We've got just, just under half of respondents were more interested in reading or learning about sustainable fashion than they were a year ago. I think on the surface, that's quite a, a simple or um, rudimentary statistic, but it does perhaps give a little bit of insight into just the power of clothing and fashion to be that vehicle or conduit for, for public or broader understandings of, of sustainability. And beyond that, there's there's this curiosity to, to know more about where clothes come from. So uh, the survey showed us that, that, I guess, put simply, audiences want to know more. But if you go to the next slide as well, thanks. I think when you dig a little bit deeper into that desire to know more, we start to see that gap emerge between audience appetite and audience literacy in sustainable fashion. So only a quarter of those who completed the survey find it easy to understand how sustainable a piece of clothing is. And the majority actually don't feel confident explaining relatively common industry terms like net zero, circular economy. I think that really brings us to, to the crux of today's panel, but also the series as well. It's that question of, what is driving that gap in understanding and how do you address that consumer literacy piece kind of head on? Um, the survey tells us that, that consumers are increasingly aware that fashion or that their fashion choices have environmental social consequences. But when you try and kind of dig in or evaluate those consequences, you can be, as a consumer, confronted with this overload of quite vague and complex ter terminology that's, um, that's hard to find. You can have sort of too much information not enough information or even sometimes the, the wrong information. And I think what this really underscores is, is that need for more meaningful dialogue between brands and consumers in the industry. If you go to the next slide, please, Faith. Thanks. What the survey tells us is that sustainable transformation of the fashion industry requires that communication between stakeholders. But for consumers in particular, that communication really depends on clear, concise, accessible information and actually transparent and, and constructive stories. So according to our survey, brands that are doing that kind of important sustainability work need to keep those communication strategies top of mind if they want to win and retain um, interest and in some ways sort of investment as well. Um, so those are just a, a kind of whistle stop tour of some of the, the statistics that shaped that, that early approach taken uh, with, with this series with the GFA. And I think we're, we're hearing more from, from policy and brands um, in the next section of, of, of this panel. But just to, to quickly pause on, um, uh, if you just go to the next slide, Faith. Thanks. Um, some of the principles that really have guided our content and sort of grown out of those insights um, is transparency. I think remaining really committed to substantiating claims, a commitment to uh, science-based facts checked stories, staying curious about what you see. Um, and you can see that through the films themselves, uh, many of them peppered with statistics and context and expert opinions. But transparency is also about speaking about kind of impact with authenticity, even when that means kind of uh, owning up to, to previously uh, poor decision. One of our, our films with Feity is a really powerful example, example of how a brand can take us along on that journey and, and what the sort of taking taking you along with them in real time, looking at uh, sort of that brand learning and brand knowledge. Um, visual, and again, this seems um, kind of a, a simplistic thing to, to share as part of the approach, but really want to come back to that statistic at the, at the start where you've got three quarters of people that want to know more about clothes uh, versus a quarter of people that actually um, feel that they can tell you how sustainable their clothes are. So how does transporting viewers through a supply chain or life cycle, how can that make information more visible and accessible and actionable? 
um, precise. So thinking about how we select price precise terminology uh, that cuts through that that complexity. Um, would love to shout out the the as part of the series we put together a, a fashion glossary, which decoded some of the the key terms that kept on cropping up. And again, using that sort of relying on that expert voice words with the, the Center for Sustainable Fashion to sort of draw that up. Um, and human led as well, looking at uh, character led storytelling to really be the conduits of those uh, of that information and, and relying on strong characters and protagonists to, to help bring those to life. Um, and finally, just thinking about how uh, we can keep content educational and interactive. So supplying tools that that or takeaways that spur on meaningful change. I think just to return to that, that um, statistic at the start, if everything tells us that people are paying attention to this conversation, the, the role that fashion has is it can go or it can take us far beyond trends and seasonality. And it becomes this, this tool for connection, a real sort of visual messenger of, of who we are. Um, we put together uh, something called a fashion calculator, which drew viewers, drew um, BBC.com users into that interactive process and tapped into that innate connection that we have with fashion to uh, kind of spur on meaningful action. Um, I'm going to pass back to, to Faith to run a session with our, our panelists, but but first would love to just play some content for the series. Um, if anybody has further questions on the survey or the series, you can get in touch with me directly, um, but please enjoy. Fashion is art, is life, the way to tell stories of communities. What we wear is something that ties us to our people and to our ancestors. It has a spirit to it. Fashion is a powerful engine to express our identity. I've been a pre-loved champion for as long as I can remember. You get that sense of individuality, which is really important to me. We all love fashion. I think you're going to be wearing this next. But there has never been more of a spotlight in the industry. It is one of the most resource intensive industry in the world, and we need to change that. Currently, dyeing garments and fabrics uses trillions of liters of water. We're essentially poisoning all the water we can drink. I almost feel guilty about making new clothes in the world that there are already so many. Fashion is finding new ways to change. We're seeing collaboration and innovation across all industry, adopting more respectful work environments and living wages, as well as embracing circularity. Using natural dyeing techniques like microorganisms, we can make a tremendous difference to the ecosystem at large. Our mission is to bring the beauty of nature into textiles, and nature knows no waste. The fashion industry needs to reduce its negative impact to align with the 1.5 degree goal set by 2050. It's not only a question to setting targets. We need to walk the talk and meet those targets. Current trends in fashion is that increased consumption leads to increased destruction of the environment. We've got to break that trend. I have a one-in, one-out policy. I encourage all of you to slow down, buy less, but buy better. So it starts from the wood, actually, right? Yeah. The industry has an opportunity to reimagine and innovate the entire value chain. The big thing for me is the idea of appropriation. It's just a reminder of the things that were taken. The more that we are doing that work to listen and learn and share resources, the better we'll all be. I am an optimist. Who well on the dance floor. The industry can be positively serving the people and protecting the planet. Combating climate change is an opportunity that we all need to embrace. There is no other way.
Thanks so much, Lara. It was really um, great to get that little presentation um, in terms of, yeah, how you put that together. I hope everyone enjoyed that trailer. Um, as Lara mentioned, there's lots of uh, films and I'd really encourage you to watch them all. They're all a couple of minutes long and I spent uh, a really nice evening a couple of weeks ago just looking at them all and enjoying all the really human-centric stories in them. So thanks, Lara. We're super excited about Fashion Redressed here at GFA. So now let's switch up a little bit and move on to the next part of this webinar. We're going to have a panel discussion about some of the things Lara mentioned and um, also a couple of other bits and bobs as well. So I'd love to welcome our speakers to, to, um, to the screen, I guess. We've got Baptiste, we've got Caroline, and we've got Lauren. Um, hey, everyone. How are you doing? Very well. Thank you, Faith. Good. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Baptiste. Great. Um, I think we're missing Caroline, but um, she'll be joining us when she can. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, <laughs> how are you how are all? You? I'm good. Great. Thank you. So, um, yeah, after after that presentation from Laura, let's jump into a conversation that um explores some of these themes and more. So, uh, let's see. Um, let me just find my questions. I think it's really interesting to start defining terms and maybe that's where we could start with a bit of an intro. I'm really passionate about communications and how we make sustainability more accessible. Um, and I think that some of these um, films and some of the topics that Lara mentioned around being transparent, visual, human-led education are really, really valid points. But each of you come to this conversation as speakers um, with expertise in quite different parts of our industry. So I'm um, in this panel, I'm going to try and connect some of those dots and um, yeah, see if we can get some deeper, more nuanced answers to this as well. So as Lara stated, it's quite difficult to, uh, for consumers at least, through their research they found, difficult to get through all these different sustainability languages, different actions, and the glossary does kind of keep growing. We have different buzzwords that keep coming in and out as well. Um, so I'd like to come to you first, Baptiste. I hope you're having a good day. It's good to see you. Um, and this question I have um, is around, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that, Baptiste. I'm just checking my notes. Um, just around what makes these complex terms so complex in practice where does the complexity come from? Where where do you think the beginning of the confusion sometimes does come from for consumers? Um, and maybe you can give a brief intro to yourself as well and what you do. No problem, Faith. But first of all, anyway, thank you for, for having me here today. I'm very happy to be able to, uh, to participate in this GFA Academy um, uh, session. So good afternoon, good morning, everybody. I saw from the chat that you are uh, present all over. So I'm Baptiste Carré Pradal. I'm the co-founder with Bente Bauer of To Be Policy, which is an organization which is supporting brands, startups, um, multi-stakeholder initiative to understand the different sustainability regulations coming out of Europe and therefore to see how this will impact their operation, their work, their marketing, their product development. And together with the GFA, we are, for instance, uh, supporting the work of the Policy Hub, a platform upon which the industry comes together. So to come back to your question regarding why those terms are so complicated, and therefore what I will be telling you, I'm always taking the policy angle in this part of the conversation, I will tell you also what it meant for policymakers in, in a clear way. Those terms are simply complicated because they um, echo differently to each and every customer. When we talk about something sustainable, if you and many surveys were done in this way, some people will say, for me, sustainable is something which is respectful of the planet, something which is um, preventing climate change, something which is mindful of animal welfare and ethics. So ultimately, you reach a situation in which this term, sustainable, which is um, an excellence label in a certain way, actually hides many different understanding and ultimately is potentially uh, englobing so many reality, that legislator ultimately considered that um, it's a type of terms that should not be used moving forward. That you should not be able to say a brand is sustainable, a product is sustainable, a uh, approach is sustainable in practice. You were, you were mentioning uh, faith that uh, the glossary keep growing. 
Uh, but now actually, and we saw indeed so many words, so many adjectives that were created years after year, depending on some trends, uh, depending on some topic. There was sustainable lately. It was all about regenerative. That ultimately we came back to the idea that policymakers decided that after having had an exponential curve of different terms to describe what the industry is doing, there will be a big glossary shrinking, shrinkage, uh, in the sense that many terms will be banned and shall be potentially banned already. So that's a word, that's a type of the word sustainable. I could say the same about eco-friendly, environmentally friendly, any words which is not clearly defined. And therefore, what we do see in terms of terminology, we see a move from terms which are, let's say, generic, which are here to reward excellence, but therefore excellence, which is complicated to define, because again, everybody will think it's something different, to terms which are, go which are more towards performance. So also to come back on the conversation we had like a few a week ago around what's a sustainable brand. Now I would say we don't talk anymore about if a brand is sustainable or not, but we talk about brands which are performing or not. In a sense that Frederica rightfully mentioned in a video that it's one thing to set targets. It's another thing to meet the targets. But those are the two key processes that the industry is facing today to set targets regarding decarbonization, re regarding reduction of the environmental impact, reduction betterment of the um, ethical practices along its value chain. And after it's about how you meet those. So therefore we see a movement towards vague terms, sustainable, to more practical terms such as biodegradable if left three months in the outside of your garden, which are much more describing something that you can measure and you can tangibly um, work. So it's definitely this move towards sustainable brands, to performing brands and therefore moving away from vague and generic terms to more performance oriented terms. Okay. Love that. Um I'm hearing I'm hearing I, I'm really appreciating how you're kind of um making this uh, journey for us in terms of where the industry's been and maybe where it's going. Um interesting and fascinating to hear about the glossary shrinkage. Maybe we'll talk about that a bit later and um yeah, moving towards words that can be in some some way measurable. I feel like that's quite a big theme too. So um, next, I'd like to come to you, Lauren. Um, you're, I think you're here in Copenhagen, maybe just down the street from, from our GFA offices. It's so good to see you. Um, I want to come to you next. Gunny is one of those brands that a lot of people really look towards in terms of uh, communications. And I want to hear a bit more about that. So um let's let's hear maybe let's get a bit specific with this question so um i know that you're focusing a lot on carbon reductions and that's a really technical topic uh in terms of delivering those reductions so how do you translate that technical information to your community and what do these terms what are some favorite terms for you at the moment how do you feel the, the journey with you at gani has developed yeah, for sure. Also happy to be here. Um, yeah, so just for those on the call that maybe don't know Gani, we're a Danish women's wear brand based uh, out of Copenhagen. And we've been very vocal about our journey on sustainability because we feel it's actually very important to uh, not only share the wins and the results of the work that you're doing when it comes to sustainability, but also to... Uh, educate the, on the challenges as well because it's an extremely complex topic Um, there's not really a quick solve or an easy answer or one solution or one size fits all approach and so for us being very transparent in terms of our journey was really important to be able to then communicate the wins when we had them but also to yeah share when maybe we didn't and I think uh, how that originally started was actually very much uh, based on the internal communication at Gani. So when we started on the sustainability strategy and Faith, I know you mentioned specifically carbon because that's like a really big focus area for us as a brand. Actually, like our first like port of call when we were setting like carbon targets and trying to like figure out, okay, how do we reduce our carbon emissions? It was very much focused on how do we tell the rest of the team at Gani here? Because you know, we also can't assume people that work within the fashion industry also understand these things. Maybe you work in design or you work in marketing or you work in customer service. That doesn't necessarily mean that you know about sustainability either or you necessarily know about the issues that the fashion industry faces. So really like the first touch point for us was how do we uh, educate the teams internally? And when you use words like 
net zero or decarbonization or scope one, two, and three, it's almost confusing people more. And we really need to get to the crux of like, what does that actually mean? So for us at Gani, it's like trying to humanize those conversations and really break it down into a level that we can all understand. And also to be honest, it's also to make it interesting. So for us right now, we have um, a 50% absolute carbon reduction target by 2027. That is the goal, but we don't really communicate that a lot of the time. What we're starting to communicate is a campaign called 7 by 27, which is seven ways or seven work streams that we have that we think if we action those seven streams by 2027, we will then reduce our emissions 50%. So almost making it like marketable when we say seven by 27 and making it something that people remember and people can then hold on to rather than words like decarbonization, net zero or scopes. I hope that makes sense. It makes great sense. I really like that insight around almost sort of like testing or exploring or learning how you can communicate with your community outside the business by starting inside. I think sometimes we forget that fashion executives, people who work in the industry don't know it, like don't necessarily know all of the definitions either. And I find that sometimes definitions change between business to business, between stakeholder to stakeholder. And of course, you know, global languages are different. Things get translated literally differently, um, which is also something we won't explore in this call, but, you know, worth mentioning. Um, So thanks, Lauren. Um, I want to say hi to you now, Caroline, and hear a bit more about your work. Um, You're working to, uh, to bring transparency to the value chain, which I think at this point, a lot of us understand as being really foundational to, you know, communicating sustainability. So, What role does tech have in this whole conversation and where are brands today from your point of view? Yeah. Uh, Yes, what lies behind is the big world of data. Uh, So I'm Caroline, very happy to to join and contribute today to this masterclass. I am based in France. I'm more on the tech side, working for ESCM Solutions. Uh, We are basically a software platform helping fashion luxury brands in digitizing their supply chain upstream so all the process of producing a collection getting the production in your warehouse all this process implies people uh, operations and through the platform you get the visibility over these operations and you can work in real time with everybody all stakeholders that's our objective So tech definitely uh, will help the brands and will be the the catalyzer for the brand to achieve these uh, these commitments of decarbonization, net zero. In which sense? In the sense that to do so, brands need data. Data really lies behind all these commitments. Uh, You need data to communicate to the consumer, to analyze and to make better informed decision throughout the value chain, throughout your production process. So data is really a a, a catalyzer in tracking the data. You need technology, uh, aggregating it and, and communicating to the final consumer, especially if you want to communicate digitally. Of course, tech is here for you. And so far, brands have been working a lot manually. Uh, and some still do, uh, which is no longer possible given the legal constraints and the urge to really transform the the industry. So we are here to help the brands work differently. uh, So really transforming a process to also reinforce the partnership uh, they they may have with uh, suppliers, because of course suppliers, they are the one producing collection, they hold the data, and they are at the center of this attention. So it's how you bridge the gap with them, how you reinforce your partnership with them, and you engage them onto your practice also, and how you can produce more sustainably. Uh, Because it's not only about the product itself, the level of materials, the composition, it's also how you have produced your product and how you can make it better. So through the platform, for example, since you can work in real time uh, with your supplier, you will be able to really follow up on the quality of your production, for example. And so you avoid to have a non-compliant 
stock or products. So you really make sure that what you produce will go onto the market and no waste. You will be able also to react in case you have to change a transportation mode. So to avoid transporting by air, for example, which has a much more uh, impact. So that's all these uh, kind of action and decisions that we facilitate and that we help the brand to make in a better uh, informed way. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just jump in there to see. Um, I really like how you're talking about partnership a lot, because I guess at the crux of this conversation, it's about finding words that we can use across everyone who engages with fashion at whatever part of the whole value chain of the industry, right? So um, maybe I'll come back to you now, Baptiste. And also a reminder to the audience to um, be, be dropping questions in. We'll be coming back to them in 10, 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, Baptiste, uh, what are you hearing that you like? What are you hearing that's sort of connecting to some of your initial points on what words can and can't be used? Because we've got Caroline here being able to... Um, provide a tool that actually, you know, maybe gives brands the confidence to use certain words, but are they, you know, we're hearing from you that they, there's words they may not actually be allowed to use. So what do you think this gap is moving towards? Or I wish I knew exactly where it was moving towards. If I'm saying that is simply because this is exactly the conversation which is happening today at with regulators to understand exactly what can you say finally, what can't you say, and what do you need to say anything? Just if, if a company in the future wants to talk about the decarbonization pathway, there will be very simple questions such as, can you account for offset? Are you allowed to say that you will be reducing your carbon footprint if you use offsetting technique to reduce your carbon footprint? This is a very material question that today members of the European Parliament are discussing about. Because virtually all of those elements regarding what is good enough to be communicated, what is robust enough to be communicated, will be regulated in the next few years. And therefore, we, we, reach, we reach a time where we have the very interesting element about we know the principle of things, that you should not mislead the consumer, which is a basic law today in Europe and in many other jurisdictions. But what does that mean technically to mislead the consumer when you talk about the carbon footprint of your product? There is no agreement on what it means. So there is some elements, there is some very robust practices that are put forward, but we don't know exactly what it means. So therefore, that means that we have to make the difference today between what people have to say because law will push them to certain things and where there is still conversation and the need to have better definition. And I will quickly touch upon those type of elements. Today, what we know is that even if what I was mentioning, that there is a, a glossary shrinking uh, and a glossary shrinking moving forward, there is, however, more and more transparency that will be needed by law by many organizations. Many of people listening to us today, some of them mentioned that they were students, some of them may have a different background, is that the company that you are working for, that you will be working for, for instance, there is a new law in Europe that is already voted, passed, that will force every company to disclose their carbon footprint. Actually, at the very beginning, Lara was mentioning that only 10% of the consumer considered that brands disclose enough information regarding their uh, GAG emission and other elements. By law, in the next three, four years, it will be 100% will have to disclose exactly all of their carbon footprint publicly and the pathway they intend to take in order to reduce this carbon footprint. So what actions I'm going to do, shifting energies, uh, changing different processes in my value chain, etc., etc. So therefore, that means there will be more information on very precise points, but I come back performance information that will be disclosed regarding carbon, um, uh, ethics in value chain, water uh, performance, et cetera, et cetera. So very clearly defined element. Then if I zoom to, um, people may have heard that I'm French, if I zoom to what's happening in France, there is, for instance, in France, particular regulation targeting the fashion industry only that requires, uh, uh, that's called the loi GEC, that require, for instance, to systematically disclose information regarding the provenance, the country of origin of the fabric of your materials, where has it been dyed, where has it been knitted, weaved, and where has it been assembled. So in the past, you had the made in, in the best case scenario, that just told you the final assemblage and the final cut and sew where it's happening. And now there is a law that says that you have to disclose information which are much higher in the value chain regarding the provenance. And France has already passed a law, which is called the climate law, that will force normally, so the, the law is passed, we don't know the content of the, that's a French system, we, the law is passed, but we don't know the full detail of the law. So therefore, we know that by 2026, every producer, let's say every brand putting product on the market will have to disclose the environmental performance of the market, 
based on a method given by the French authority and using a label given by the French authorities. This is being finalized as we speak, a few months to go about this conversation. But this will be suddenly a first in the world where systematically the industry will have to disclose its environmental performance. Again, we talk about performance in a much more normalized way. We don't talk about is it sustainable, is it green, is it... No, no, no. We talk about applying a method to calculate a environmental performance, a bit what Lorraine was mentioning regarding if you talk about decarbonization or things like that. So therefore, that's a type of point that we look forward. And then after, there is many conversations which are happening about for other jurisdictions or in Europe, like um, also uh, Caroline mentioned about data sets. What's a good enough data? Uh, we had example in our industry of certain countries challenging a lot certain data if you want to talk about the betterment of your footprint to the public. And this question today is not finalized. We will see how it goes. The commission itself will have it, will propose a method, which is called the PEF, that they recognize already as a method that could be serving this purpose of substantiating a claim. They also have data behind it, uh, the official EU database to calculate footprint. So there is some elements, but still many part of this conversation, to come back on your question, are still to be discussed. We see the direction. There is more mandated information to be given publicly performance-based and still final conversation on what is good enough data and robust enough method to enable communicating to the consumer regarding the environmental performance of your product. Mm, okay, amazing. Thank you, Baptiste. It's so, uh, I don't know about what the rest of the audience thinks, but to me, it's just kind of exciting, very exciting to understand the depth of work being done in this part of the industry in terms of communicating sustainability. And as you were speaking, Baptiste, you were talking about um, what is good enough data. I feel like that's something we've been talking about for a long time and will continue to be, to your point, Caroline. But also I'm hearing um, a lot of levels of information I'm going back and back and back um, in all different directions. So to come, to come back to you, Lauren, as someone um, working in a brand who can kind of bridge the gap between possibly this world that uh, Baptiste and Caroline is speaking about and the consumer, which is what this webinar is about. Um, you know, how how far do consumers care maybe? Or um, you do a lot of work on educating the consumer. What's the impact? I think like the impact is hard to measure, to be honest, but I think we just have such a responsibility as a brand, like when all this legislation comes in and we need to publish the data or like our carbon emissions, it's not going to mean that much out of context. So we also have a responsibility of a brand, not just to like slap that information on our website, but also to do the work to explain this is what it means and this is what we're doing about it. Like to Baptiste's point that we'll have to also then share like almost like the strategy of how we're going to reduce and so, yeah, I think for us, um, for a long time, we have like a separate Instagram account called Gani Lab, which is really a space for us to be able to deep dive into everything we're doing on responsibility. And then what happens on the main Gani Instagram channel is like much more of a, like a high level conversation or like a snappy one liner when it comes to communicating sustainability. And I think moving forward, we're going to have to like align those things so that we would have like the top line message but then you can find all of the information directly underneath it so yeah we're of course then sharing as a brand but then inherently like hopefully educating at the same time but I think it's a little challenging to know the actual impact that that's having I mean we haven't done any like customer sentiment surveys or anything like that but we we do know that the Instagram account of Gani Lab which is the feed which is 100% dedicated to sustainability grows month on month which is which is amazing and yeah we often hear it get referenced in certain things so that's great and if we could merge that channel to like the main our main communication channels yeah hopefully then it would reach a, a wider audience and hopefully then have more impact <laughs> I love the Gany Instagram uh, Gany Lab Instagram I've always just found that such an um a simple way to bridge the gap um and I I, I think I really liked your point around this information doesn't mean much to a consumer, to a citizen without being in context. So uh, that that responsibility that you feel as a brand to actually explain that 
think is definitely part of the solution. So I'll just quickly come to you now, Caroline, for a final quick question before we head to the Q&A. Um, your work is very much in the context of tech, data in the value chain to provide transparency. What like one or two data points do you think a, custom, a consumer should be looking for or is interested in? What do you think they have the most interest in? Mm. Yeah, because um, the fashion industry is a very rich data ecosystem, so you can find a, a lot. And, and as we move on, we go deeper into the, the level of information. Um, I would say first to look at data that is owned by the brands. Um, not easy to explain, but definitely if a brand starts to communicate, she is engaging her responsibility. She has made the work of structuring, of getting and collecting data. So that's reliable, not necessarily data that is available on an external platform or something else. I would definitely look at what the brand directly communicates. And it, with that in mind, um, with the acceleration of the law these days, uh, not all the brands are at the same level of transparency uh, so far. Definitely, it will take time. So the ones really investing at the moment are the largest brands and companies with the resources or maybe emerging brands that have a very asserted positioning and uh, engaged uh, product positioning. Um, but Ajac Law in France, it's true, is uh, has been a bit pioneer and is showing the path. And I would focus uh, on this basic information that Ajac Law uh, requires because they are really the basics uh, brands should be uh, controlling and, and manipulating. So on the product uh, composition, the chain of uh, uh, countries of production, uh, if there is a, uh, dangerous substances, these are basic uh, information data that the brand should definitely have. Carbon footprints of uh, transport, at least, is something also quite reliable uh, with uh, different uh, yeah, uh, calculations that are pretty uh, stable, uh, standardized. So carbon footprint is also uh, quite reliable. Um, yeah, I think also as a consumer, that's what I would be looking at, first of all. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, great. Um, I'm loving how we can sort of bring these different perspectives of you three as experts into this conversation. And now I'm going to turn to the Q&A and just see what's happening in the chat. So thanks everyone who's contributing. I'm loving the um, questions and um, Baptiste, thanks for replying to a couple of them. I'm just gonna, um, let's see. I'm interested in this question from Cynthia. How interested do you find people are in circular economy? Um, speaking more precisely about the solutions like resale, repair, recycling seems easier. What do you think? Uh, that's one of the questions that's open to the group, actually. So maybe, um, yeah, we start with, with whoever that resonates with. Is circular economy working for the consumer right now in terms of comms? I'm happy to give a first element. Lorraine, Lorraine, you were um, also unmuting yourself, so happy to go. In terms of, if we look at the success of anyway the resales platform, there is evidence that therefore there is today a growing market, a much grow, a much significantly bigger visibility to all of this market than just 10 years ago when it was definitely niche. And now we talk about huge corporations, which are um, of a different scale. Um, I think of Vestiaire Collective, I think of Vinted, I think of other platforms like that. So there is definitely a clearer uh, work on that. When we talk also about repair recycling to follow down the perspective. Um, so let's say the consumers have much more visibility on the resale because that's also the most visible for them. The recycling, for instance, if I come back to uh, my perspective on regulation, there will be there is already a law in Europe that forces, for instance, by 2025, all waste to be sorted. And there is facilities which are being created as we speak in Europe. I have, uh, as an idea, Eastman in the northern France for multiple billions, which will be dedicated to fiber to fiber recycling. So therefore, there is infrastructure being created. There is elements which are happening right now. There is technology being developed where brands are investing massively to develop the technologies of tomorrow because 
every brand today will tell you that they're all aware that the future will be in circular economy. Uh, one of the key solutions will be one of the, it's not a silver bullet, one of the key solutions will be in circular economy. And that goes towards fiber to fiber recycling. So it, once you have done the resale and once you have done the repair, of course. But then if the idea is that resales, yes, it's much more known. Everybody will name many platforms and many of the people I think listening to us may be customers. And then the infrastructure more industrial wise to, but to booster recycling are being developed as we speak. And laws are here to even accelerate this movement. But Lauren? Yeah, I mean, I can just add to that then with like uh, the, the Ghani perspective on it, which completely aligns with what you've said in terms of uh, we run a resale platform uh, and we have found that it's been extremely successful. We do know that our, our customers are looking for an in-store experience of resale. So that's something that we're looking into for next year. So it's not just online resale, but also yeah, physical and in-person. Uh, and we've also partnered with a couple of those resale sites as well, and we'll continue to do so. With repair, we also run uh, yeah, a free repair station in our London stores with a company called Sojo, and that has been extremely successful. And what it's actually been is it's not only repairs for faulty items, but it's also um, repurposing. So maybe adding like a, a different element to to the clothing to make it feel new again. That has actually been more successful and had a higher uptake than like uh, faulty or yeah broken clothing. So I think that's a, a a good finding there. And then when it comes to recycling, I think this is less so on the customer side to be honest, or it's not really what we hear from our community. But this is where our primary focus is behind the scenes within the sustainability team at Gani, which is the fiber to fiber recycling. So ensuring that any waste that we generate uh, on an annual basis is able to go like back into the system and to be fiber to fiber recycled, or we're making sure that we have the infrastructure and setups to yeah handle any uh, waste products that we have there out on the market. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Thank you both. Um, hopefully that might answer another question in the chat, which was directed at you, Lauren, about um, consumer behavior towards ethical consumption. I'm, I'm, I won't ask that to you directly because I feel like you kind of responded to that question with your, with your case studies, which sound great. Um, jumping now to another question that caught my eye around, um, around brands having a fear of living up to the burden of public expectation on sustainability. And um, in the chat, it's asked, um, I'm I'm going to translate this question as one about green hushing, the phenomena of which um, the industry stays quiet on their sustainability work for multiple reasons, including, um, you know, maybe they're not sure how to communicate it. Um, the question asks, what are your opinions on this? And is there anything that we can and should do about it? Again, I'll leave that as an open question. Quick answers, please. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can just start in saying that I think it's such a shame because we speak to a lot of other brands in the industry. Like you might think that fashion is competitive, but within the sustainability space, it's very um, collaborative. And we do hear that a lot of brands in light of legislation coming are stepping back on communicating sustainability. And that would be a real shame. We really need a lot of brands to communicate the work that they're doing because there are a lot of brands doing good work out there. And if we remove that from the conversation, then you're not going to have the drive from consumers asking for more information or asking critical questions or being curious around where their clothes are being made. We, we need to have these conversations. So I think it's a real shame, actually, what is happening. And this uh, fear, I think, for a lot of brands is very real. Yeah, so I can only echo Lauren um, to say that it's extremely unfortunate, and unfortunately, it's, it has direct operational implication. That um, uh, un unfortunately, few extremists have weaponized certain legislation to kind of prevent and didn't want the industry to talk anything about sustainable because of whatever perception. But as a result, I I had conversation with some brands that said, for instance, there is no more for us now case value to go for certain types of fibers or certain types of processes. Because to invest more in a technology while not being able to communicate it to our consumer creates a challenge for the additional value. So the thing is that to make sure in my view, like what, so the question of uh, Winnie is extremely good. 
So it's happening, unfortunately. It has direct uh, impact. It doesn't allow to make any distinction with some of the worst of the worst brands and the brands that were starting to do something, that were trying to do something, and that doesn't help the consumer in any way. So that's one of the elements. Now, what people can do about it, hopefully to push for legislation that will clarify what can be done, not to have green hushing become the new norm, and to really have and empower the brands to be able to communicate performance-based, scientific-based anyway, but still to communicate to be able to move forward. Yeah, if I can add, I think it's uh, that's why the law is uh, coming up, is to rationalize and put a frame around that, which is needed now, uh, given the acceleration of the, the constraint and, and, and to also rationalize the data, because you can do a lot with data, you can analyze a lot, but what is really uh, relevant, what is needed for the consumer, so that brands can also put priorities, uh, because it's a very... A strong transformation they have to go through to set up uh, this communication to have this data available is a long term process it's not only a short term response it's a long term process to transform working uh, working modes and that uh, that takes time definitely and if you if you rationalize data uh, at least the consumer will trust what uh, he reads he will uh, he will be confident about the reliability of the data because at the moment for example we were talking about what data to look at if you think of um, life cycle assessments of the product LCAs for example and scoring that Baptiste was mentioning for example in France coming soon it's not stable at the moment. The method of calculation, the objective of the of the scoring is still not clear enough. Yes, there should be um, standardized calculation provided by the government and maybe from Europe. There is also already something, but it's too early to really rely on the score that you will see uh, and you won't be able to compare it precisely with another one. So it's good to yeah make a space around that and to all agree collectively, at least on the level of data that should be uh, communicated. Thank you, thank you. I'll um just pick one more very quick question. I'll direct it to you, Lauren, because I think you it's most relevant and a quick answer, please. But it's about um communicating with a younger audience or a m more mature audience. Do you find any insights around the age of people who shop Danny that are interested in this information? No, actually we don't. I mean, we haven't done in-depth study, to be honest, on like who the Ghani customer is and, and preferences and things like that. But our communication is targeted very broadly. It's not segmented. So we haven't actually found a difference between, uh, no, for, between uh, age groups. Amazing. Okay. That's really, um, I feel like the this conversation, I'm glad it's a, it's a series because we've got a couple more of these um, hours booked in for the next couple of weeks. But for now, um, I would like to wrap up this conversation by saying thank you so much to, um, to Baptiste, to Lauren, to Caroline, and of course to Lara for sharing um, those insights at the beginning and for celebrating Fashion Redress. Hey Lara, he's still there. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so we've just done questions. I'll skip that slide uh, and just mention that the next um, the next conversations in this series from GFA Academy will take place on these dates and we'll really build on this conversation. We'll be looking more at consumption and the consequences of it, as well as um, ideas on how to identify which brands are sustainable and which aren't. So um, I've really enjoyed moderating the session. Thank you all so much on this afternoon. Um, and the last thing I'd invite everyone to do, um, thank you for joining us audience and thank you for your questions, is take a look at the films from Fashion Redressed. You can just use this QR code and you'll see some of the first few, um, few films on the GFA website. So thank you all so much. Hope you have a great afternoon and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.